we're going to be doing, I put the files, um, actually I should have changed this, this is actually day five um, steering folder. So look under day five in the zip file um, and grab the solution. And they're in, um, the solutions when they come in will be under an SRI slash CMS flow slash solutions subdirectory. Just uh, have those moved into that one so that if we do choose to run or whatever, I wouldn't um, actually overwrite the solutions before I start talking, talking about it. So you'll notice a little bit this grid that we're going to be working with today is a little bit different. It was a previous run that we've done for a previous workshop. Um, and so these were already run, and we have a month's worth of solutions to go over. So this grid looks a little bit different um, than what we have been working with this week, and some of the names uh, are a little bit different. So, um, but you should be able to follow along um, pretty easily. If you have any questions, uh, write the CMS support users that's in the chat here, and then we can cover some of those uh, towards the end of this. So one of the first things that we're going to go over is the annotation module. And along the bottom of your screen, you'll see a bar that looks something like this. And so the annotations are in this very final button um, tool. And when you enable that, it brings up another set of buttons uh, that kind of goes between the data tree and the graphics window that give you access to the different things. So this one tool at the top, I've got denoted as what we're going to use to select and move and edit preferences for the various animations and different things that we're adding in. And all the other ones below that are mainly there to create the specific um, different types of, animation, of annotations. So we've got capability of loading in um, images and logos just uh, they're just images, and they're just towards the top of the screen, so they're always going to be visible. A dynamic scale bar that will show, and it'll allow you to, as you're zooming in and out through different areas of your grid, it will adjust and resize the scale bar accordingly. Previous versions, um, it was a static scale bar, and so you really had to recreate it for every view that you did. So anyway, um, there's a dynamic work arrow, so as you're panning around and rotating in oblique views, this north arrow will always point towards the north uh, to make it a little bit easier for your um, plots and uh, different images that you might save to put in a report. Same thing with text lines, over ovals, and rectangles. We're not going to really go into those, but you have the capability of adding that onto um, the top, uh, top layer visible on your screen. So the first thing we're going to cover is the north arrows. And so um, essentially I've got this um, grid loaded, the project, and there's nothing showing except for what we have been working with. We've got our uh, quadrate grid showing. We've got the other things loaded in. So what we're, we would want to do to enable these north arrows is to choose the annotation module. So you go down and you just click that button. Um, and then it will change the options that show up here in the middle. Uh, you'll choose the North Arrow option. And then you would want to, once it's selected, you would just drag a box that basically says, this is where I want that North Arrow to go um, in screen location, screen coordinates, and how big. And you can always change this later on. Um, once you have dragged the box and uh, click your final point there. It'll bring up a dialog to open, and you'll just have to find where those north arrows are stored. And they're stored under wherever you installed SMS, and then a subdirectory called support files, and then within that, another called north arrows. And so once you find that location and open it up, you get a, a choice of 10 different options. And if you have your own that you want to use at some point, you are welcome to use that. There's nothing special about these other than, you know, the white space is made to be transparent in all of these. So you might not find that if you have one that you've just located on the web that you want to use. But you would 
just make a choice of whichever one, and in this case, I'm just going to choose the third on the top here. It's a little bit wider, uh, simple in the work arrow. So you just choose that, and then once you click open, it'll show up where your box was. If you want to make modifications to this, you would want to um, make sure that this tool right here for selecting the different annotation objects is enabled. Then you can just click right on it and move it around and resize. And then if you wanted to edit some kind of properties, you would just double click right there. Um, for the scale bar, I'm picking up um, where we left off here. The north arrow is already here. Um, we're going to change and use the scale bar that's located right here. And once you choose that, a similar action, you have to define where your scale bar is going to go and about the size that you want it to be. And once you finish that, it will bring up a dialog that looks kind of like this. And you can edit the units, whether it's uh, feet or USD, international feet, meters. I was hoping there would be um, some other larger scale units. For right now, though, we're limited to meters or feet. And um, we've got to fix that because um, it doesn't make sense to be showing large areas with meters. You want to see kilometers or, or maybe even switch over to miles. And for right now, for whatever reason, that those options are not available. You have the option for spacing of the text. Um, the font, the size, the color of the text that will show up in this box for the numbers, um, division width between the different units, um, background colors, things like that if you want to fill behind it. Um, and then you just click OK and it will show up. And right now this is kind of what it looks like, 500 meters. But as you zoom in and out, it's going to resize and give you a little bit um, more information. Uh, for whatever zoom level you might be in. Um, the next thing we might want to do is, depending on the type of data you're looking at, you would probably want to look at different contours, um, either the range or the palette. And kind of what I'm showing here, on the left-hand side, we're looking at depth in meters. And we've got um, a Q ramp specified for the palette method. And it's got reds for the minimum, uh, blues for the maximum values. That just means as you go deeper into the water, the values get bluer and bluer until you reach the maximum uh, of your range. I do have uh, linear contours turned on at this point, too. Um, I didn't have a, enough room to really show this in the um, PowerPoint, but we've gone over that a little bit already, but we haven't really talked about these color options yet. So one of the other types of data you might be looking at is morphology change. You wouldn't necessarily want to use these same uh, colors. And so what we have available is a user-defined um, palette. And all you would do is choose user-defined Come over to New, and you can define your own as far as the values and the colors down here. Or well, we have some predefined um, that would come up and some options. And one of those options is magnitude difference. And that's what we typically use to look at things like morphology change, where we would want to see pretty much white conditions or white color everywhere there's negligible change. And then towards the warm or the cooler scat side of things, depending on erosion or accretion. And this is uh, definable. A lot of people will look at erosion as um, blur. But some uh, different districts or uh, consulting companies may want to see um, those identified as red. Um, for whatever reason, I've seen both sides. And to do that, what you would just do is change. You would just mark reverse here, and it would flip the colors from one to the other, and then reflect that in the legend. Um, one of the things that you want to make sure when you're using this magnitude difference data set is that you really need a symmetric range. So you notice here in the 
the values here, I have negative 5 to 5. And then because of this, um, we'll also need to make sure that we have an odd number of contours being reflected. And that just basically gives us a single value that represents the zero. And then the individual values moving up and down from there. So we'll, in this case, I have 11 um, contour levels shown. And I've got five on one end, five on the other, and then one exactly for zero. And that really helps us um, set the screen up like this. So we see the erosion in the channel around the, the tip of the jetty and a little bit of the sandbar that's um, forming around here, some um, accretion that's happening in the channel, things like that. And so this is um, after a full month of simulation, so 30 days. And this may seem extreme, so we, you can always go in and modify you know, the different parameters for your sediment transport and see what makes more sense in your area. So. Another type of data set you might be looking at instead of magnetic difference or depth is uh, current velocities. And so I'm showing that here. Um, and you can set up your uh, current velocities. So I've set a range of 0 to 1. It doesn't make sense to have negative values in your range. Um, so just make it from 0 to whatever you think should be the maximum to really show off what's going on in your channel. Um, the current range for this particular simulation goes up to about 1.4 or something. But I've maxed it out at 1, so that means that anything that's over 1 meter per second velocities will all have a red color. And um, I've gone back into the palette and changed to a hue ramp. Um, this is still marked over here as being available, but it's not being used. That's only if you have the user defined. So we're choosing the hue ramp, and I've actually reversed these colors. So now my minimum values are blue, and the maximum values are red. And this really helps show the velocity to increase that occurs right within the channel as you flow. But you can make this whatever you would want. So these are just a few of the changes that you can do with changing the contour levels. And I'll go in and I'll show this in a little bit um, in a few minutes in an actual demo. So the other thing that you might want to turn on when you're looking at currents or transport rates or some other types of data sets that you've loaded um, are visualization of the vectors. These are the intensity and direction of the current um, in the form of vector arrows. And this is overlaid with um, the scalar colors as well. So you have the um, current speed reflected in the colors and the actual directions and intensity um, with the arrows. And so you could go in and um, set a range of values um, for what the right the vectors are looking at. And that way, if you don't want to see arrows in areas that have below a certain threshold of um, current flow, you can actually change this value, and then those will disappear, and you'll only see vectors where you have um, significant velocities, uh, as whatever you determine. You can change the minimum and maximum size of those arrows. You can change this option to scale to magnitude and give a percentage. And that way, the, the arrows will be uh, relative to the range that you have. There's a couple of other options. You can change the size, the color, the shape of the arrow head, the arrow itself, things like that. Um, you can turn on this uh, box here, where it says arrows follow flow path, and basically um, that will enable the arrows to become curved in the areas where there's um, one arrow over an area and it's a quickly uh, rotating area. So instead of getting uh, arrows that kind of point out of a vortex or something like that, they'll actually kind of wrap around and make it a little bit easier to see. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different options that you can do here. Um, so just play around with it and visualize uh, what you want to see um, the way you want to. So.
So there's a lot of different options. Another thing, once you get um, your color schemes and your vectors and your logos and arrows, everything kind of set up how you want it, one of the things that we sometimes want to do is instead of going one by one through these time steps to see what it looks like, we may want to gather all of those into an animation and uh, present those to an audience of some sort, whether it's your uh, customer or if you're giving a discussion in front of peers, things like that. Um, you can wrap this up into a film look. And to do that, you basically uh, get everything how you want it to appear in the window first, and then go under data, film loop, and then you'll be able to assign a file name um, to that particular animation, so you can change the directory and things like that. Uh, you can also save it out as a KMZ file, which you can bring into Google Earth and also visualize these animations. Um, but I'm just going to be showing here creating an AVI file uh, that's just going to sit on your disk. And so we'll do a transient data animation. Don't worry about these others for right now. And so once you get that step, the directory, you click Next and come in and tell it, OK, I want to see an animation of how long of the run. So we've got a total of 720 hours for this particular one that we ran. Um, that's available. That's already been loaded. Uh, but you may not want to see the entire thing. You may only want to see a portion of that. So you can change the um, number of hours that you want to see. And you can also change the starting time. So if you don't want to look at the first day or first week, then you can start a certain period and then see what's happening after that through the end, something like that. So you can change these around to get the exact time frame that you want to animate. And then the next uh, page is basically uh, how you want the animation to appear. You can uh, change some color schemes and things like that with this display option box. Um, there's an option for clock, so that would put in some location on your screen um, a round or square object that basically um, transitions through the, the process of your animation to, to visualize how much time is completed out of that. Um, and then just some other information about the quality and how, fine, how big the file is going to be. Then you just click a, uh, Finish, and it, you have to wait a few minutes for it to actually go through every step in the time step window that it's going to be monitoring. And then once it's done, it will come up in its own application um, by ADI. It's called Pavia on your, your uh, computer. And then it will start playing. And then you're able to start and stop, um, tell it to continue uh, in a repeated loop or to go backwards and forwards. You can change the speed of the animation. And then if you stop it, you can just proceed one frame at a time if you want. So it's a nice little tool that SMS and Aquaveo provide for looking at these animations um, and being able to manipulate time as, as opposed to the one that comes canned with Microsoft. Or just runs. You can pause it, but you can't really slow it down or anything else like that. So this is kind of a nice tool. So another thing that you might want to do with the, the data sets that you've run, um, as you see over here, I've loaded in um, a depth three times. So this all comes in the morphology file, the depth and the morphology change. And then I've also got um, velocities. And so that also brought in a current magnitude uh, data set. And I've got water surface elevation as well. So I've got these five data sets. I've got all the time steps associated with those. So I might want to see these in a plot before I actually start working with the data. Um, and there's ways to export information out to other um, products that you might want to use to visualize and do any plotting for you. Um, but the, the gist of it is basically for some types of data, you might want to see at that one, at a certain point, maybe a point that matches up with a gauge for a measurement, you might um, want to just create a point. And so what we need to do is to create an observation map coverage. 
So as we've done in the past, we have right-clicked here, and chosen New Coverage, and then we'll just come into the General option up here and choose Observation and click OK. Once you do that, we have another uh, coverage here. And then we can select and make sure that any points or arcs that we're putting uh, for visualization of these plotting is going into that observation type. And so what we'll do at first is just look at a Taylor data set value three times. And to do that, we'll need to add a point. So we would create a feature point and place it in a certain spot where we want to see the data, the curve um, for. So I'm just choosing a pot, uh, point right here in the inlet um, where maybe the velocities are the strongest or, or what have you, whatever you're looking at. Um, so we'll place that point there. And then the next thing is we'll need to come under display and choose um, plot wizard. And you can also get that down here on the bottom. I think it's this option. Uh, I'll show you this when we get into the, the demo. But when you uh, do that and go into the plot wizard, it brings up a lot of different types. And some of these require other data sets to have been loaded that have the actual calculations, or not the actual calculations, the actual measurements of the observed data. And so um, we're not going to go over that in this particular um, webinar. But what we're going to do is just move down here to time series. And so we'll choose time series and click next. And there's a, another option here for setting what type of information and how much we want to look at. So we're looking at the observation coverage. And we are going to do a scalar type of function. And that brings up the scalar data sets. So you notice there's no velocity vector or transport rates or anything included in this tree. If we chose vector, then we could, um, I'm not really going to show that right now, though. So we've got these set. And I want to look at it for the entire uh, period of the run, which is 0 to 30. We've created that one point, and so we can click this point uh, in this window to actually visualize for that point. If you have multiple points created for different areas, you can turn them on and off. You can also give them names when you uh, create them so that you can tell them apart here. And just turn them off, on and off. But for now, we're just going to show this one. and then. Um, one of the simplest ways of doing this is to make sure we choose the you selected data set. Otherwise, you would have to have previously selected a certain data set in the main window, and then it would only be acted on here. So we give the option to use the selected data set. By default, everything is turned on. And so you would wind up, in this case, with four different um, currents. So we're going to turn off everything except for water elevation. So uncheck those boxes. The next thing you have to do is just click Finish and wait for it to go out and grab the values and create the plot. And so this is kind of what it looks like. It's not the best looking plot. Um, but we have there are other plotting packages you might be able to export this data and work with. But this is just for within SMS to be able to quickly visualize this and see what's going on. Um, as I showed before, you can zoom in to certain areas and look at only that period of time or range um, in the curve. If you wanted to um, export all of this data that you're seeing here that's been extracted to that one point, you could right-click and then there's an option to export those values. And I'll show that in a few minutes when we go through the demo. So another thing that you can do is to um, look at a profile line across certain areas and see certain types of information for that. So one thing that I'm doing here is I'm creating, also in the observation coverage, I'm creating an arc um, across this inlet. And I just want to look at the velocity. Uh, and actually, I'm not looking at velocity here. I'm going to be looking at the, the depth across this line through time. And one of the things with the depth um, data set in SMS 
because it visualizes it, okay, but normally SMS likes dealing with positive values and showing them um, moving up from some baseline. And so if we do the uh, plot for our normal depth that we get out of uh, from our simulation, what we'll see instead of the actual shape going down and showing the channel, will actually be a mound. It will be inverted. And so what we need to do before we um, look at the data for this particular case is to go into the data calculator and invert the sign on this depth. So we would go into the data calculator. I would choose um, depth. Oops. You would select depth here in the simulation. Um, in either select one time step that you wanted or check the box for all time steps, and that's what we're going to do. And once you do that, you would add this to the expression, and you see how it's reflected here. So we have, uh, we'll put a minus sign on the front to change the sign. But then we want all times contained within the D5, which is right here, uh, data set. And so once we give it a name, we can click Compute, and we'll come back out, and then it's reflected in, in the interface over here. So the next step to do is now that we have that, we would go into the display uh, editor and choose um, observation profile. So you would choose display, plot wizard, observation profile. And then you come up with a little bit different uh, looking dialog than we did before. And so on this one, um, it also has the coverage here so uh, we can make sure we're in the right one. It shows all the arcs that are uh, populated within that coverage. And it gives us a choice here of extracting a profile. Um, so right now, um, we just created an arc. And it has two nodes, one at either end. It doesn't have any vertices in the middle. And so if we just extracted the information using those two points, we'd only get two points of data, and it wouldn't really um, be represented what we wanted to see. So what we can do is tell it to extract the profile from where our model cell edges and centers interact with that arc. And so we've got the model intersection set. If you have um, gone onto that feature arc and added vertices at a certain um, spacing, say um, every five meters or three meters or something like that, and there's an option to choose that in this dialogue. And um, you'd be able to see your curve reflected at those points rather than the bottom intersections. So anyway, coming down here, you want to see, uh, make sure that you check the right coverage um, that's down here. And then also on your data set, do the specify data set and choose the um, newly created um, data set we use for the, with the data calculator. So I just call that inverted depth. Uh, check that box. You get a, a couple of names if you want, um, some modifications to how the plot's going to show up. Um, and then I'm choosing to leave this as the active time step, and I'll, I'll give you a ranking in a minute. Uh, but you could just choose a certain specified time step and then figure out which one you wanted. Um, but by choosing active, you can actually see the curve and step through these in this window, and it'll update the plot. So let's click Finish. And this is one of the times that we can look at um, that shows the channel um, that we defined with that arc in the, in the first place. Another option here is once we, we've done this, as I mentioned, you can go through the different times and see this plot update. But there's a lot of um, times in this, this range. There's 720 times that it's got to, um, to look at. And so rather than doing that, we might want to build an animation that shows this window for a time. And to do that, what we're going to do is uh, come back out. You will want to keep the plot open to smooth it out of the way. And you can um, go back into your film loop options under data film loop. And there'll be a new option available 
um, that let you choose certain plot windows of plots that it's already calculated. And you can choose between those. You notice on this one it shows that this is plot 3. So we've got that plot 3 uh, made available. Then you would click Next, go through the other options that we had before, and then it would build an animation of that particular um, plot. And so you would be able to see that through time and stop it, go back and forth, and things like that. So it's kind of nice to do every now and then. Um, so.